If you can't tell by the title, holy moly! What is up, football fans, Dolphin fans, all you fans? I am, I just got finished, <laughs> just got finished in interviewing Richmond Webb, one of the greatest left tackles to ever play for the Miami Dolphins. I'm literally going to have that interview play for you guys in about five minutes, just going to do my normal spiel, but I just got to tell you something. He is the coolest man on the face of the earth. The fact that he took a Saturday out of his time to come on and let me interview him, ask him questions about the Dolphins now, the Dolphins when he played, the draft, the future of the team. I'm just, I'm, I'm like, the whole time I was interviewing him, I was doing this because I was just, I was just so nervous. I didn't want to look like a big dumb dumb and ask him stupid questions. But yeah, that's about to happen. I'm going to put that up in about five seconds, but want to do my usual thing where we got trivia today. Trivia today. I want to ask Richmond Webb the trivia question and see if he would have got it right because he definitely would have because it was around his time of playing with the Dolphins, but I was too nervous and if I didn't write down the questions I wanted to ask him, I would have would have forgot what to say because wow, was I nervous. I got to get over that because I'm getting more Dolphins on this channel for you guys. So... Here's the trivia question. Who is the only Dolphins player entering the 2019 calendar year to post three sacks in the postseason game? In a postseason game. Three sacks in a postseason game. Be sure to comment that below. And now I will tell you guys the uh, answer after or before comment of the day. So let's jump into the interview with Richmond Webb. And I hope you guys enjoy it. And I hope I don't look like a big idiot. Oh my goodness. Here you go. Hey, what's up, everybody? You're you're not gonna believe who I have right here. If you can't tell who this is, this is one of the greatest left tackles to ever play on the Miami Dolphins, Richmond Webb. How are you doing, sir? How are you doing? Boy, how you doing? I'm doing all good. How you doing? I'm doing really well. So I wrote down a bunch of stats that you have, and it's 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 pretty good. It's pretty good. You're all pro. Five years, you went to eight playoff appearances, first round pick. Now, um, just going to ask you a few questions. First off, how are you and what have you been up to lately? <laughs> Doing good. I'm glad uh, to be on the show today and uh, I'm glad you helped me out with Skype. I hadn't done it in a while, but uh, man, you made it easy and uh, I'm, I'm ready to go. So everything's good. Um, Dolphins finished on a strong note, and uh, just getting ready for the Super Bowl next weekend. Definitely. Are you are you going to be there? Are you going to be in the, in the stadium for the Super Bowl? I'm not going to be. A uh, buddy of mine, which you should know, Keith Jackson, yes. um, he has a um, charity event in New Orleans, so I'm going to go down and support him. So I'll be in New Orleans for the Super Bowl. Nice, nice. Very, very nice. So, like you said, you know, the Miami Dolphins finished the season pretty strong. You know, I think they won like uh, five, the four – Four of their last five games, they only lost about one or two games in the last stretch of the season. And looking at how the Dolphins started and then how they ended, what is your what is your feeling on Brian Flores? Like, how how do you feel about like I know it's too soon; it's only one season. But like, how do you feel about him as Dolphins head coach so far? Well, I, I really like him, and uh, you know, I think uh, what I told people early on in the year, just interacting with fans and stuff on Twitter, Facebook. You know, social media, the thing was, was that I knew it was going to be a tough year because um, he made some changes to kind of get rid of a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And we traded off a lot of players that, you know, people questioned that we possibly could have kept. But uh, I think he wanted to start with a clean slate. So I knew we were going to have a rough year this year, but mm -hmm. I didn't expect us to win as many games as we did. <laughs> but uh, to just saying to say that, uh, when you know you've got rid of all your caliber, you know, good caliber players, mm -hmm. and you still get guys to buy in. And what I noticed about the team was every game they played from start to finish, and they played hard. And if you can get get guys to buy in at that stage, and with all the draft picks and stuff we got, if we build it the right way, it's not going to take long turnaround. So. I was very happy, very excited, especially the way we ended the season. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And, and like you were saying, you know, 
they, they got rid of a lot. And a lot of people, I don't know if you you agreed with a lot of like the media and some of the fans saying that like we got rid of the players because we were tanking. But it, do, do you think that they were, the Dolphins were tanking or do you see it just as starting from the ground up and rebuilding this team right? Starting from the ground up, uh, even, you know, um, when we traded, um, say, like Kenny Steele's and Larry Tonsil to mm-hmm. the Texans, I thought, you know, when you get a left tackle like Tonsil, a lot of times those guys are hard to find. And um, you normally hold on to guys like that. But in a way, it was a good situation. They got two first-round picks. And the Texans desperately needed someone to protect Deshaun Watson. You know, I live here in Houston, this and that. So yeah. I understood it. And the thing I kept going back to is I understood what he was doing. And I can remember when um, Jimmy Johnson took the coaching job at the Cowboys mm-hmm. and he first Walker and got a, a ton a ton of draft picks. And I, I, I said, I think we got like maybe 15, 13, 15 draft picks. And some of them are considered like, like three first round draft picks. I said, if half of them, if you just get half of them right, that makes a tremendous impact on your team. So I understood what he was doing, and we had to take it on the chin this year. Mm. But, you know, I was thinking maybe two or three games, and we far exceeded my expectation. <laughs> so it was a good thing. And, and, and I think some of the people were, that were saying we were tanking, the thing is, is Nobody wants – you can't go into a room of 53 players and say, guys, um, we're going to just lose these games on purpose so we can get a draft pick. Nobody wants to just go out and lose games. And I don't think the guys that are currently on the team, you can't sell guys and say, okay, just go out there and do whatever you want. Nobody wants to lose. It's, 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 it's not fun. and You're not you're just to collect the check. So I never bought into that, but that was a huge saying on social media. And I was like, no, we're not doing it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. One of the, I would say one of the 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 weakest parts of our team right now is the position you played your whole entire career, which is the offensive line. Um, can you do you see a way like that they could possibly fix this offensive line in one season, or do you think it might be like a, a bond that has to happen between the five guys in the front? I think you can fix it, and it might be a, a combination of a couple of free agents. A couple of draft picks. Um, I was at the draft last year in Nashville. We um, we selected Michael Dieter in the third round. I, I announced that pick, yes, and did. you know I watched him early on. And I can I think it was maybe it was the Dallas game or it was a game after that. But anyway, this guy was a guard, and we had a couple tackles went down, and this guy moved out to tackle, which is tremendously hard to do when you're used to playing uh, interior line. But um, Paul Hart gave it all, is all this and that. So when you have guys playing like that and you add to that, now he's got a year up under his belt of experience and you add a couple other pieces, it's not going to take long to fix it. I, I don't think it's going to take long at all. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So let's talk a little bit about your career. Let's talk about your time with the Miami Dolphins. So You've been to eight playoff appearances. Pretty much most of your career with the Miami Dolphins, you were in the playoffs. You had Dan Marino as your quarterback. Like, come on. <laughs> Is there a big difference? Because I've we've noticed, especially in this past uh, playoffs, that like some first round by teams, like like the Baltimore Ravens, lost bad to the, like the Tennessee Titans. Is it different playing in the regular season versus playing in the playoffs? No, no question. It, it doesn't matter what the sport is. It's definitely a difference. And uh, normally the level of play reaches another notch because, you know, if you lose, you go home. And everybody knows what's at stake, whether it's the Super Bowl, whether it's the World Series, uh, NBA Finals, this and that. You want to try to get to the Super Bowl. And I think the thing with the Tennessee Titans was – I think around December, they got hot at the right time. At the end of the season, they were hitting on all cylinders, and they knew what their identity was. Um, didn't necessarily throw the ball a lot, but they were a physical team, and they used um, uh, uh, Henry to just smash mouth football, and the second half, he really just really got hot, and he got stronger as the game going on. And they played good defense, and uh, that was the formula for them. And uh, – 
it, it, it worked well, but um, most of the time it does help to have that first round by if you can. I, I think what hurt Baltimore was they had the first round by, and also I think week 17, they rested a lot of their starters. So you got three weeks that you hadn't played in a while, and it just seemed like they, they had drop passes. And they, they weren't as sharp and crisp as they normally were. I, I, I could see that. But that's all it takes is, you know, one bad game and, you know, you there, but you at home. And, and that's what happened. Yeah. Yeah, it's it. That's why I like the NFL playoffs the most versus baseball, basketball, hockey. It's one and done. You got to put your best best game, or or you're going home. And it's just it's better to me than playing like five games because you could flub up the first game and be like, ah, we got the next four. Um, so you you play during a decade where you had to face some of the best defensive linemen in NFL with Bruce Smith, Michael Strahan, Charles Haley, Reggie White. Who I don't want to put you on the spot and, and like make you pick who the best one you went up against was, but like, what, what was it like going against these guys? What was like some of the like the things that went through your head when you're lining up across like Bruce Smith, who you had to play twice a year for ten years? Yeah, sometimes uh, Bruce, I had to play him three times a year because we would go to the playoffs and then we would see him again. But um, you know, all those guys, I I'd probably say Bruce was probably for me was the best because. I had to play him so many times, mm. um, but um, it, I think it was the rivalry between the Bills and the Dolphins. And when I first got to Miami, I really didn't understand it. And then I went back through the history, and I think it was during the 70s. I think the Dolphins beat the Bills like 20 times in a row. <laughs> so, <laughs> why do these Buffalo Bills fans do not like the Dolphins? <laughs> you know, I had to be. T- O.J. Simpson, because I, I can remember when I was a kid watching Monday Night Football, this and that. And, you know, of course, the Dolphins had, like, Greasy Zonka, Mercury Mars, um, all those guys, you know, the, the playmakers. And, and they were just going up there just thrashing them in Buffalo and then come back and spank them in Miami. And so that, that leave a bitter taste in my mouth, too. So I understood it. So it wasn't hard to get up for that game. But, you know, one of the things that – I think when I got to the Miami Dolphins, it was already established, very disciplined team, and the expectations were high. And the thing we always was at the beginning of the season was win the division first and then get in the playoffs and then see if you can get to the Super Bowl. So that was the expectation from day one where we've had quite a bit of time where we haven't went to the playoffs. So these guys, they got to find themselves and get back there a bit. Um, I think we're heading in the right direction. So I'm looking forward to seeing the Dolphins in January and hopefully February too. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty I'm pretty sure all us Dolphin fans would love to see that. And it seems like I, we were talking about, me and the subscribers and stuff we're talking about, that it seems like that rivalry with the Dolphins-Bills is slowly like churning up again because lately it's been like Dolphins-Patriots. It's like, you know, the Dolphins always give the Patriots a hard time and vice versa. Where lately, where it's like back in the 90s, it was Bills, Bills, Dolphins, Bills. It was always between you two guys of who's going to win the division and who's going to, you know, get get to the next step. And now I really do think that I think that rivalry is starting to come back. It's like the Jets are the Jets and the Patriots look like they're on the downslope. And it seems like now it's it really that rivalry is coming back up where it's Dolphins, Bills again. Yeah, it, it's no question. And, and, and you can kind of look at the. The Patriots, kind of like the Dolphins, were probably back in the 70s, the 80s. They've been so dominant for so long. And uh, like you said, the Dolphins look like they're on the upswing. Uh, Buffalo's made some transition, got a quarterback to snap. Um, they've made some some changes. So now it'll be some some, some parity in, in the AFC East where everybody's kind of on an even slate and just say, okay, let's let's see who let's see who wants it the wants it the most rather than just you know, having the Patriots just run through everybody. It's been, I understand what the Bills were going through back in the 70s. I can say, <laughs> ready for something to change, yeah. So you were talking about your rookie season coming in and, you know, not understanding the rivalry between the Dolphins and Bills. What was your, what was it, first off, what was it like being drafted? Because you went for, you want, you were the Miami Dolphins' first pick in the 1990s. And I know nowadays the draft, like, if I don't know if you saw what the stage looks like in uh, Vegas, but it's going to be on water. It's not going to be on the fountain. What was the draft like for you, like, 
first overall pick for the Dolphins, ninth overall. What was that like? And then what was your rookie season like? Because you walked in and got in the huddle with Dan Marino and Duper and Clayton. So, like, what was that like for you? It, it was, you know, like you said, the draft has changed so tremendously um, from the time that, you know, I got drafted. Uh, I was at home with my parents, and I had a, a just a regular house phone. I'm trying to think. I think it was digital. It did have a cordless phone. <laughs> that far back. But, uh, I remember being at home with my, you know, my brother, sister, and uh, my parents. And uh, But it was a few guys would normally go to New York. That's where the draft was held every year. Now they move around in different cities. And it's it's almost like going to the Oscars or something. It's, I mean, the NFL really does a great job with uh, that there. But um, got the call from Coach Shula. And, and my only thing was I wanted to go somewhere warm. And uh, it was perfect. Went to South Florida. I said, okay. I really knew about Marino, Duper, and Clayton because the Dolphins always played on Monday Night Football. And I remember in college and stuff like that, watching those guys that uh, got there, got signed, and then just, you know, me and Keith Sims, and then walking in the huddle, and you actually in the huddle with guys you've seen play on TV. So it's like you, you kind of starstruck in a way. And, um, um, I got there and just, you know, Dan Marino was the man. And the only thing in the back of my mind was, I said, I don't want to be remembered as the guy that gets this guy hurt. Cause I, <laughs> you know, he was, he was the man that, um, uh, learned a lot from Dan Duper Clayton, you know, they took us under our wing and, you know, the veterans, you know, we had a tough coach, but we had veterans in place that demanded excellence as well. And those guys kind of brought us up. We knew what to expect, this and that. So um, it was challenging, but, you know, we look forward to it because we had great guys ahead of us, veterans that led us, and we just we just bought in. And, and it was it was uh, it was a learning curve, but it made it better when you had the support system that we had. Did it help going against like like some really good defensive ends on the Dolphins during training camp and uh, and all that stuff? Yeah, I, I worked against every day. Uh, Jeff Cross, he was a Pro Bowl player. Uh, Hugh Green and uh, EJ Junior. And I, I think the thing that really helped was uh, John Sandusky was our uh, offensive line coach and probably one of the best to ever coached the game. And I can remember after minicamp, I think I stayed down in Miami for some. I came from Texas A&M. We were more of an option running team, so I had to work on doing the two-point stance or the gun for three wide, you know, four wide receivers. And in um, the preseason, we played the majority of the preseason. So in the preseason, we went against the Eagles. So I went against Clyde Simmons. You know, they had Jerome Brown. Yeah. Rick, <laughs> Minnesota Vikings they had um, Chris Dolan who played the Chicago Bears they had uh, Rich Penn and then uh, we went against um, Denver they had uh, Simon Fletcher and Carl Me Mecklenburg so by the time I got through the, um, the preseason it was like all pros every week so that really helped because like okay this is what you're going to face Every and it didn't get any easier. And those guys, they 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 look to take advantage of a rookie. They want to put it on. Uh, but the good thing, man, chilled and everything just worked out for us. It, it was it was good for us. That's awesome. That's awesome. Now, one of my last questions is: if you notice now a days in the NFL, because you played during, like I said, you played during a time where it wasn't as easy as it is now. Like especially with the quarterbacks, the wide receivers, no contact after a certain amount of yards, all that stuff. Would you like? You're seeing a lot of these offensive tackles and these linemen catching touchdown passes. Did you ever go to Shula and say, "Hey, let me roll out for a pass or something," or were you just like, "I'm good at blocking. I'm just, I'll stay at blocking." I was like, you didn't go to Coach Shula. Uh, <laughs> you stayed in your <laughs> If that was going to happen, he would have brought it. And then uh, that probably would have been fun, but then you don't want to be the guy that gets open and then misses an easy pass with Dan Marino. So that might have been a blessing in disguise. <laughs> I said, 
Y'all gonna do that with somebody else out there. <laughs> yeah. I gotta imagine because I heard I heard stories that Marino's ball, like the way he would throw it, like he could break fingers. So I could just imagine like your first time rolling out as a tackle, and he whips one at you, and you drop it. He's gonna lose it. <laughs> you know he's Italian, so you didn't you, know, you didn't want to have him upset on the sideline. This pass where he had a chance to score a touchdown. So I was like, nah, y'all keep throwing it to Duke and Clayton. Guys, we're good in here. Definitely, definitely. Well, before I let you go, first, I want to thank you for coming on the channel. It was absolutely an honor to have you on the channel. I want to talk about the Hall of Fame. Now, Zach Thomas, he is a, f a finalist, finally. Like, the man should have been in already. You should have been in already. I don't understand why you're not in the Hall of Fame yet. Like, the, this, the stats and the accolades I'm looking at right now, I don't understand why you're not in the Hall what is your thoughts on Zach Thomas hopefully going into the Hall of Fame? And, like, what is your thoughts on the whole Hall of Fame process? You know, it's a tough process, but uh, I, I know I definitely got the numbers to be in there. But um, since Zach is this close, I, I want to see him get in. Uh, good guy, played with him. He was one of the leaders on our team. He came in after me, but um, we're both from Texas. And uh, uh, I haven't been to Canton since Jason Taylor went in, so – It'd be good to get another Dolphin uh, put in. So I, I'm looking forward to making plans to go to camp and see Zach deliver his uh, Hall of Fame feet, Hall of Fame speech. So uh, it'll be good. And, um, you know, Jason, uh, he mentioned me in his speech, and that definitely helps. So uh, guys are keeping my name out there, guys like you, other people on social media and different writers and stuff. So as long as that happens, it's a process, and it takes – Longer for some guys, but I definitely know uh, my career is definitely wor worthy of that honor. But I'm I'm rooting for Zach to go ahead and get in this year so he can get that out the way. Definitely, definitely. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming on. Is there anything you want to shout out? Like you said, you're going to be in New Orleans for the Super Bowl. You want to shout that out, let people know? I will be there. So if you're in New Orleans, I think most people will be in uh, Miami uh, or probably like Las Vegas or whatever. But uh, New, New Orleans is a fun city, great food, uh, this and that. So I'm looking forward to going there, my wife going down. So um, just thanks for the, having me on my show. It was fun. You made it easy. You made me look <laughs> so I definitely appreciate that. And love all of the Dolphin member really you have in the background. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's my team. <laughs> I have it tattooed on me. <laughs> Repping them dolphins hard. I, see. <laughs> I love the, love this team. Love this team. But thank you so much uh, for being on. It's an honor. I'm gonna put your Twitter below. Got to follow him on Twitter. L love Richmond Webb. One of the greatest dolphins of all time. Definitely should be in the Hall of Fame. Thank you so much. Thank you. You have a good day, sir. You too. Again, one of the coolest individuals I have ever had the the chance to talk to you. Again, thank you so much, Richmond Webb, for coming on the channel. I'm going to pop his uh, Twitter up, I'm, or I'll just leave it up from the end of the interview, and go check him out. Seriously, the coolest down-to-earth down guy I've ever interviewed. I'm, tr I'm going to try to get current players on the, on the, on the channel. I'm, I told you guys, 2020 is going to be huge. I'm trying to get a lot of people on the channel. So before I get to comment today, <clears throat> the answer to who is the only Dolphins player entering the 2019 calendar year to post three sacks in a postseason game, that is, drum roll please, I have no one here to drum roll. Defensive end Trace Armstrong in the 20-17 to victory over the Seattle Seahawks in the 1999 AFC wildcard game. And some of you guys might be like, Doug, you just said the Seattle Seahawks in the AFC wildcard game. Yes, Seattle used to be um, an AFC team, fun fact, before they transitioned over to the NFC West. This was back when there was a Central. There was an AFC Central and an NFC Central. Fun fact. So let's get into comment of the day. This comment comes from Noah, and this is what Noah had to say. Whether we draft Tua or not, I'm excited to see what happens in the draft. Now, I picked this comment for comment of the day because a lot of what we're doing, especially me as a content creator and a Miami Dolphins YouTuber and a guy who tries to bring you all the Miami Dolphins news, uh, we like to tell you who we would want. A lot of players, a lot of fans, not players, sorry, a lot of fans would say what, who they would want. And a lot of us will look at film and look at players and stuff, but like Noah said, whether they draft Tua or not, I'm excited to see what happens in the draft. Me as a Dolphin fan, there's certain players that I'm excited for, 
But I, in a whole, I kind of, what you have to do as a Dolphin fan is kind of just take a step back and just let, trust the process. Just, we'll, we'll see what they do and let's see if they pick the right person. Because at first, from jump, from the front face of it, it might seem like, wow, that was a stupid draft pick. Why did you take so-and-so over so-and-so? And then in the end of it all, it might turn out to be way better pick than the original pick. Like taking Aaron Donald and then Blake Bortles goes before him. See what I'm saying? So when it comes to the draft, because I know there's the whole debate about taking quarterback, trading up for a quarterback, taking Tua if he falls to five, trading up for Tua, taking uh, you know Andrews, the offensive tackle, trading down. Tra it's fun. And I'm not telling anyone to stop doing it because it's fun. It's something we love to do during this time of the year. It's fun. Keep doing it. It's a blast. But when it comes to who they actually pick, you just gotta you gotta roll with the punches. So I like it, Noah. He's excited for the draft. But other than that, be sure to check me out on Twitter and Richmond Webb. I'm gonna pop them up again because man, oh, I can't believe I interviewed Richmond Webb. But be sure to check us both on Twitter and Instagram. You know, I I break a lot of news. Be sure to check out the Bit Boys. This is my second gaming site. Great content over there. If you like what you see, hit the subscribe button. Don't feel like you need to, but if you do, it would make me feel good. Other than that, give this video a thumbs up. Do I have to tell you why to give the video a thumbs up? Richmond Webb was on the channel. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna try to get more. I said this before. I'm just gonna try to get more dolphins on here. Current dolphins. Um, I'll see if I can. It's gonna be a little bit harder. Uh, I have to thank F Fanatics, the Facebook uh, page that I did a podcast with. That's how I met Richmond Webb. That's how I got in contact with Richmond Webb a few months ago. And that's the only reason why this really happened. So Fanatics, Josh, Ferris, thank you so much for allowing this to happen. Give the video a thumbs up for that. And the video a thumbs up because you like the content. Other than that, check out DolphinsTalk.com as well. Great, 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 great site that I'm a part of. Uh, podcasters, beat writers. Go check them out. Other than that... Hit that subscribe button right in the face. Send it to the moon because you're going to get more content. You're going to get more content like this. You're getting a ton of more content, draft, draft analysis, mock drafts, free agency, breaking down the roster, breaking down prospects, top, so much. So be sure to hit that subscribe button. Other than that, I might go live tomorrow. Yeah, I think I'm going to go live tomorrow around noon, 1 o'clock. So I'll see you guys tomorrow. Other than that, like usual, stay classy. Thank you again so much, Richmond Webb. You have no idea how much that meant to me. You probably had no idea that I was nervous interviewing you, but I'm a big baby. And like usual, stay classy. Things up.